I'm speaking to Gabriel Schiavone, who is on the Audacity of Hope, and we're going to talk about some of its experiences. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Tell us, why were you first interested in the Palestinian situation? Uh, well, I got uh, into it through anti-war work, actually. Uh, my elder sister is the one that sort of radicalized me when I was a, a child, and uh, you know I'd, I'd hear these like radical like ideas and critiques of government violence or like government power that was illegitimate and that you know it's very uh, an easy thing to understand, uh, but and it was also very different from everything I would hear at school or even in the household. Like uh, my father was Republican and. My mother was a, a liberal, but still like not at all like into like radical issues of of challenging like unjust systems like from the the root causes of in, in, in the United States. And uh, but it was always between my sister and I growing up. And when uh, U.S. war on Iraq in 2003 happened, and that's when sort of I met other people, other young people. They were college age. I was high school, and um, it went from there, like that's when I first like developed this community, community, and Palestine was one of the issues I learned about back then. Let me ask you, go back a step, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Tucson, Arizona, a border town, about a half an hour, 40 minutes from the U.S.-Mexico border. That's where I was born. Well, we hear a lot about the border issues, and uh, supposedly Arizona put these strict laws because of tremendous violence coming from immigrants. What, what is your experience with that? Well, the violence actually is coming from the U.S. Um, government forces, uh, Border Patrol, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and the massive, uh, violent, uh, structurally violent infrastructure uh, that's supposedly for security. Um, but what, what it's really doing is, is killing people and, uh, and repressing them, killing them in the deserts. Uh, there's been six, over 6,000 deaths at least since 1994 when uh, the militarization policies were instituted under Clinton. And Wait a second, 6,000 deaths? Over 6,000 bodies recovered. Those are of the, the numbers actually recovered, which, you know, the medical examiners, you know, and human rights groups, they, they point out that you know, these are the, the least of the numbers. These are the ones that are recovered. And, I mean, basically what the... The, the the military policies do is is reroute migration routes into the Arizona desert, which is where the most of the deaths deaths happen, because it's the most like uh, uh, treacherous and and deadly terrain, and uh, in the admittedly part of U.S. policy is to put migrants in quote unquote mortal danger uh, to deter them, uh, in other words, to to kill them. And you, you were in a group or are in a group that uh, helps uh, migrants, no matter why they're gum coming in? Mm -hmm. The group is called uh, No Mas Muertes, No More Deaths. And direct aid is, is one part of what we do. But uh, it's in, in like what we were doing on the, in the U.S. boats and the, the international boats that comprise the flotilla, uh, aid is a, is a part of it, but very symbolic. Like the, the, the main point of it is to advocate uh, and for more uh, against the policies that are creating death and suffering. Um, so in the case of U.S.-Mexico border, we advocate for more uh, against militarization policies, inequitable trade policies, which are, which are creating so much death and suffering. And in the, in the case of Palestine, uh, the policy of occupation, the policies of siege, those are the, the root causes of, of the humanitarian crisis and the root causes of... of, of evolved so much death and suffering under Israeli and U.S. Uh, occupation. So we've covered the audacity of hope in uh, a lot of different ways, uh, but here's a maybe a different slant. How about some of the people that uh, were on the trip with you? Uh, for instance, did you get uh, to speak to Alice Walker? Yeah, I chatted with her a bit. Uh, the first thing, actually, I wanted to talk with her about, apart from, like, you know, uh, meeting her and just being in trainings with her and everybody else. Um, uh, but I, actually, the first time I talked with her was actually toward the end of our journey. I mean, um, uh, and anyway, the first thing I wanted to talk about with her is ask her what it was like to be a student of Howard Zinn, one of my um, mentors and like, sort of heroes of social justice. 
so I asked her about that and we were chatting a bit. But you talk about literature, I understand you're a literature major. Yeah, yeah, that's my major in British and American literature, and uh, I especially love uh, resistance literature, protest literature, all the way back from, you know, the Antigone um, committing civil disobedience against uh, Creon and the the Greek government to uphold higher values of family and community, and so all the way up to uh, plays by like Arthur Miller or Howard Zinn and and uh, you know great great stuff like that. So who else on the boat uh, did you get a chance to talk to who, who impressed you? Oh, uh, the, all of those people were some of the the best people I've ever met. Like kindest, uh, most compassionate, brilliant, and courageous people. Um, I was drawn very much, uh, I guess, naturally to the younger passengers on the boat. So, I, I mean, I could say that uh, I developed unique, I'm not, I don't know if it was closer, but unique bonds with them because, like, outside of trainings, you know, outside of everything, we were still hanging out together, you know, exchanging views and exchanging, um, like, our thoughts about, about things. And then going to join the Greek protests of our fellow Greek people who were uh, still going through, like, much, like, uh, terrible straits and much duress during during all of this and they were in the streets and they were uh, there was uprisings and we like joined them and su in support of them you get to talk to Hetty Epstein yeah quite a bit um, she we were just chatting about my friends uh, uh, had her in Arizona but I couldn't go to that talk and um, she was telling me about how that was one of the 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 later uh, more disappointing aspects of like she speaks a lot especially with uh, as from, she's invited by student groups but the last two talks that she was at she was disappointed because uh, no Zionists no opposition came out and she um, she rather prefers that they do and so the last two Arizona and another spot uh, it didn't happen so she was a little bit disappointed but we chatted about about um, just, uh, stuff like that and just like just real cordial like stuff that kind of the chatting we're having like just as uh, as people and, and humans uh, uh, no matter how what kind of um, station or we came from what kind of walk of life um, in the states we were all passengers on the boat and we were all going through the same experiences and and same risks and, and same work so it was there was some it was, it was interesting but let's close with talk about two of the organizations maybe who sponsored you, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voices, or Jewish Voice for Peace. Can you tell us about those groups? Yeah, Jewish Voice for Peace is a, uh, what I like about that group and why what I was drawn to it uh, is because it's got such a, a beautiful message that is so um, proliferating, naturally um, expansive and it just like grows and grows because it's got such a, a good um, inclusive message of of uh, of an honorable peace and an end to violence uh, so that uh, everybody can live in safety and security both Palestinians and Israelis and and uh, but first starting with an end to the occupation so that's just like a very simple and just message that I was drawn to and then moved me to to want to start uh, the first JVP chapter in Arizona, and that was about a year and a half ago. And by now, they're they're all across the the state. Um, so I was uh, I was uh, representing uh, that group and on the boat. Um, and it's uh, the other group you mentioned, Students for Justice in Palestine, is a little different from JVP because JVP is a you know at the end of the day, it's a it's an uh, ad advocacy organization, you know, with the there's a centrality to it, uh, a hierarchy, you know, staff and a board. Uh, whereas in SJP is really coming from uh, an, an ideology of, of uh, ending the occupation um, from a U.S. standpoint uh, from universities, which are the main battleground for uh, ending or pr protecting and defending and sustaining the occupation. Because uh, even um, Zionists and pro-occupation and pro-Israel um, forces recognize that universities are a key component in the in the battle to uh, uh, for you know uh, Israel-Palestine conflict and and so like SJPs are really like a, uh, 
they can be they crop up anywhere and it's non hierarchical and the way that they work is very decentralized but at the same time uh, able to centralize political power brain power uh, in order to get stronger and 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 push uh, an anti occupation agenda uh, across the whole United States, which is what we're doing now. Last question: Do you think there'll be more flotillas? Yeah, I think we will absolutely like again and again until the occupation ends. I mean, we see the use of boats as a, a very effective tool at spotlighting the conditions uh, under which Palestinians struggle and live under occupation and so it's been very effective up until this point so uh, a bunch of us want to keep pushing at it and, and organize more in fact uh, a new variation is uh, youth-led boats and so we'll, we'll be looking into student boats and international student boats and Israeli boats, Palestinian boats. Alright, thanks a lot. Thank you, I hope to be on the show again. Time.